And let's just make sure our chart is complete. I think it's good to go. Yep. This is the minimum amount of information your chart should have. You could also, if you wanted to, I'll do the optional information. You could write DX in here as well if you want. You can, of course, compute these really quickly. You don't need to write all this extra information, but DX, writing down DX might be a reasonable idea. Uh, DX would be A secant squared theta D theta, if you wrote that down. I'm not going to write down all the DXs, but uh, if you want to, it's a reasonable thing to put in your chart. You should be able to compute them real quick, though. So according to my notes, I only have one more problem to do out of this section. And we did what's x squared? OK. So here's our last trig sub problem. Integrate. When we write that a minus b pi equals a plus a minus b, I have that in my notes. Wait, what? Yeah, it's in your textbook. Yeah, it's in your textbook, or you can go back and look. Uh, you, don't, you don't subtract, you only add negative. Oh, oh, it was just this plane and a point. OK. All right, so there is, should be exactly one of the three forms we use here. So you could write this as 3 squared instead of 9, if that helps you recognize it. So let's figure out which of the three substitutions are we going to make. Which one? Cosine? Or sine? So x equals 3 uh, sine theta. All right, so I need a dx, of course. So the derivative of sine is cos. So dx is 3 cos theta d theta. We can go ahead and make those subs now. x squared is now 3 sine theta squared divided by square root 3 squared minus 3 sine theta squared. And dx turns into 3 cos theta d theta. So are there any questions on the substitutions we made or subbing them in? Generally, things get worse before they get better. We're doing this to take, take care of that square root, basically. So we'll get our <coughs> 3 squared factored out of the square root. So we got 3 squared square root times square root 1 minus sine squared. So square root 3 squared cancels with one of the threes. And we got 3 squared integral. Now the entire reason we did this is uh, becomes apparent now because 1 minus sine squared equals cos squared. That was the reason we made the substitution. So we got square root cos theta squared. So this turns into a sine squared integral. How do we integrate sine squared? We just learned this last chapter, or last section. Just 
we so were rewriting it. We're going to use the double angle here. So as an even power of sine, if it was odd, I could take out basically an even number of them and write them as a uh, one minus cos squared, and then the one left over would be for my u sub. But this is even, so I have to use that identity, and I'll write that down. It's probably in your notes from last section. Well, it should definitely be in your notes from last section. It's probably on your formula page. So sine squared equals one minus cos two theta over two. So again, this is a identity substitution, not changing variable substitution. So we don't ha we don't pay a price for this one. So we'll write it as one half one minus cos two theta d theta. You could do a u sub here, but try guess and check. I'll do the antiderivative one. So guess at what you think the antiderivative of cosine two theta is, and then check, see if you're right. Give you a hint, it's got a sine in it. So when I guess and check, I always guess basically the easiest thing I could think of, which is just, hey, let's just try sine two theta and not swap the, the positive to, or negative to positive. And then I check what's the derivative. Derivative is cos two theta times two. So I need to account for the times two. So I divide by two. All right, so we have gotten rid of the integral, but we still have to get back to x. So x equals three sine theta. I'm gonna copy that down. So I have a little bit of work to do here. Uh, I do see a theta, so let me go ahead and solve for theta. X over three equals sine theta. So sine inverse x over three equals theta. So that's what's gonna go in for theta which is sine inverse x over three. Now the tricky part is, what about that sine two theta? The reason it's tricky is because it's not theta, it's two theta. So I can't just use, <clears throat> if that was just sine theta, I, I would swap it out for x. So I. Um, for the theta minus sine two, theta over two, would that be positive? Because the integral of cos oh. negative sine. I could be wrong. No. So I did a guess and check. So the, in anti the integral of negative sine two theta over two is negative cos two theta. Um, okay. We should be right like this. So yeah, sine derivative doesn't change signs. Right. Cos derivative changes signs. Oh, right, okay. Except for hyperbolic, right? Those are a whole different bag, yeah. yeah. You kind of just, I don't have those memorized. <laughs> I just look and see which ones are negative, which ones are positive. They're almost opposites, but not quite. All right, so I could do a few things here. So I know that sine theta equals x over three. So I have this fact right there, and I want to find what is sine two theta. So if you go back to some of those identities, the double angle, oh man, I do not have all these memorized. Sine two u is equal to two sine u cosine u. So there we go. I think that's the only one for sine two theta right there, the only choice. Yeah. Uh, so it's two, Sine theta is x over three. How do I get cosine theta? So we use it, we'll draw a triangle out and figure out what cosine is. So here's my triangle, theta, right angle, sine is 
opposite over adjacent. So no, geez, opposite over hypotenuse. So my adjacent will be square root nine minus x squared. So cos theta is adjacent over hypotenuse. So cosine square root nine minus x squared over three. All right, so sine two theta is two ninths x times square root nine minus x squared. So any questions on building that up in the triangle? Basically the goal is to get rid of as much trig as we can. And there's no way to get rid of that sine inverse, but we can at least take sine two theta down to this. You can cancel uh, the two and the half, but that's not going to make it much better. Can you just take the square root of nine minus x squared and just have three minus x, and then just multiply the x, uh, you get nine x minus x squared? That's true. Oh, because there's some. So, yeah, it's called the freshman's dream. If this was a multiplication, then you can distribute the power. But that, in general, a plus or minus b to a c power is never going to be a to the c minus b to the c unless c is 1. It doesn't even work if c is 0. Because you would get 0 on one side and think 2 on the other. So this really only works when c is 1, or if a or b are 0. If they're 0, it's not no point in writing that minus b. So generally this would never be true. All right, that's our last problem in trig subs. The other problems, they go exactly the same. You just see is it, you know, a squared minus b, a squared minus x squared. Let's see, a squared minus x squared, a squared plus x squared, or x squared minus a squared. Three different options. Oh, that's a good question. We don't think we worked that one out, did we? So we were looking at it last class, but I did not look at it. Oh, there we go. So our square root x squared minus a squared is a tan theta. So that's our last one right there. So that's a tan theta. And if I do skip over this, maybe if I completely forgot, if I wasn't reminded because I was about to forget, uh, look in your textbook. So if something's missing, maybe, uh, yeah, if I don't have it down, just look at your textbook. Most of the things I write down are in some box somewhere in your chapter. So these trig subs really just take practice. The most annoying part is that dx gets substituted out for something that's more ugly than what it started with. So that's the price you have to pay for making this substitution. So we're about to jump into partial fractions. So let's look at remainders, division and remainders first. So let's start out real easy. 7 divided by 2. So th you, it is 3.5, or you can think about it as 3 with a half left over. So the reason 7 does not divide into 2 is because if you did long division, you would see there's a 1 remainder at the end. Now we write the remainder over the original divisor right there. An equivalent way to write this equation, just multiply everything by 2. 
it could be written like this right here. So either way, they tell you the same information. So that's with numbers. Now with polynomials, it's slightly different, except this idea still holds. So if you had some polynomial divided by some other polynomial, what you would get is a polynomial plus the remainder, which I'll write as r of x, over the original q of x. So this is how you treat remainders with uh, polynomials. So who remembers fundamental theorem of algebra? You learned it in pre-calculus class. All right, how about fundamental theorem of arithmetic? Go way back. It's not MDOS. What's that? Not MDOS, is it? No. So fundamental theorem of arithmetic is every integer factors into primes uniquely. So if I take an integer and you take an integer and we factor all the way down to prime numbers, we better get the same exact factors. So for example, if I factor 12 into 2 times 2 times 3, everybody in here would factor it down to primes like that. Uh, fundamental theorem of algebra is about factoring as well, and it says you can factor any polynomial of degree 1 or higher over the complex numbers. All right, so that's the fundamental theorem of algebra. You can factor any polynomial over to complex numbers. In calculus, however, we don't deal with complex numbers at all. So what that means is in, in this class, we're going to, we could have irreducible factors that are degree two or really any even degree. So the easiest polynomial that I can think of that does not, uh, degree two that does not factor over the real numbers is x squared plus one. That's the standard example we look at. So remember zeros correspond to factors. That was a really big theorem on polynomials. If you know about a zero of a polynomial, you also know about a factor. I can factor x squared plus one, but I have to factor over the complex numbers. Who can impress us with their complex factoring skills? So you can think of one as i squared, except the negative of i squared. So it will factor like conjugates. So that's one, just one of the many irreducible degree two polynomials, irreducible over the real numbers. Eyes. The J would curl to the other side, at least my J. The way I write my J, it would curl the other side. I know some people like to put little funky, maybe little like hats. I'm not into hats that much. More a sunglasses guy. All right, so let's go ahead and do some divisions. We'll do one division for practice, which I don't see any of my notes. These are hard to just create out of thin air. All right, 
let's come, we'll come back and do a little algebra review. So what we're going to do instead is write out how to, uh, how to uh, figure out all of your, ter your terms here. So for each irreducible factor in the denominator, so let's say we are looking at p over q. So what we're going to do is factor out q as much as you can. So it will look like q1x times q2. And these could be raised to powers as well. So we'll have q1x raised to the a1 power. And then the next factor we'll call q2 of x raised to the a2 power. There may be more factors. I don't know. But let's say there's n factors. There'll be qnx raised to the a n power. For all the examples that I've ever done, the exponents are either uh, one or two. I don't think I've ever used three as an exponent. So in class, meaning the problems that I give you, the AKs will come from the set, oh, they won't be zero, one, two, or sometimes three. And the degree of all the QKs will either be uh, one or two. So I won't do a degree four irreducible because it's the algebra would be really painful. So we won't do any degree four irreducibles. Uh, the easiest fourth degree irreducible I can think of is x to the fourth plus one. And if you graph it, an easy way to see that it doesn't have any x, uh, that doesn't have any zeros is graph it, and if there's no x intercepts, it won't factor. Uh, and that's another reason every odd degree polynomial, if this is a fifth degree, it has to cross the x axis somewhere. So every odd polynomial has a real zero. All right, so what do we do with each irreducible factor? So each irreducible factor in the denominator, we're going to get um, one term for each power. And the numerator is a polynomial, one degree lower than the denominator. With undetermined coefficients. So it's our job to write out all these terms and then determine what the coefficients are to make it equal. So we will write terms, so write out all terms and determine coefficients. Okay, so this seems very abstract until you do some examples, and then when you see it in practice, hopefully it will make a lot more sense. So we'll start out with a example that's not too bad, and then we'll slowly increase the difficulty. All the ones I'm looking at in my notes are kind of ugly.
All right, so I want to break into partial fractions. All right, so according to the rules, well, first of all, is each denominator factor irreducible? Can I factor x minus 1 or x plus 1 anymore? So they're irreducible. They're not going to get any more factored. All right, so what we're going to write on the other side, we get one term for each irreducible factor. So the first term is going to have x minus 1, the denominator. The second term is going to have x plus 1. So you get one term for each denominator. Now, in the numerator, we write a polynomial with one degree lower than the denominator. So what degree are the denominator polynomials? They're all degree one. So what does degree zero polynomial look like? A number. So I don't know what the number is, so I'm just going to write, I'm going to use the capital letters A and B. Don't write this down. It's not part of this problem, but we're very soon we're going to uh, see if I had a degree two polynomial, I would put a degree one factor in uh, on the 